Okay, so this is the story of how my mother totally obliterated my father's heart. So my parents met when my dad was 19, 18 or 19, and my mom was 17 or 18. My mom already had my older sister, was two months, was two months old when my parents met. So my grandmother and probably um, all the elders in my family did not like my mother. My grandmother saw that my mom was no good. And she told my dad that she didn't like her. And my dad did not listen. So my father joined the military at 18 or 19 years old, I'm quite sure as soon as he graduated from high school. He had, you know, to make some kind of moves for himself. He had eight brothers and sisters. Well, actually, no, I think it's like 13 because my, my granddad had two families. He had, I believe, five children with Miss Blanche. And then he had eight children with my mother. And he had my Aunt Jackie with another woman that I never met. But, um, yeah, so all those people in the house, I'm quite sure, you know, you're ready to go as soon as you can. So my dad joined the Marines and he took my mother with him as soon as he could after he finished, you know, boot camp and all that kind of stuff. So he married my mom and took her with him. My dad always told me that he didn't want, he wasn't ready to have more kids, but my mother wanted to have more children or she wanted to have a baby and so that's where I came from. But he always used to make sure to tell me that he didn't want any more kids. Ah. So anyway, eventually me and my little sister were born. After they had been together for uh, about four years. My older sister is four years older than me. So my dad would get deployed and go, he would have to go to Okinawa or Italy or uh, just different places, right? And while he would be away, he would get phone calls from his friends on base, his coworkers, his fellow soldiers, telling him that my mom is screwing other people. So my, ma my dad would do stuff like, wouldn't tell my mom when he was due to get home so he could get home and see what's going on for himself. He said that he would come home and it would be another man's clothes hung up in his closet. He said one time he came home and there was some kind of addition or some kind of cabinet or something like that built in the house. And he knew that 
it was some dude that my mom had screwed. Because my, my mom was, she was like that. She would have sex with somebody to get some work done in her house or whatever, whatever. So my dad, he just was willing to accept it. He was like, oh, well, this is what I got. Um, he wasn't, he was, he was in love with my mother and he was hoping that she would change, that she would, you know, love him back. I guess maybe he thought that, oh, uh, she did it because I was gone and she was lonely. So now I'm back and maybe we can work it out. He was really in love with her. But no, my mom was just a scoundrel. She was just a scoundrel. She didn't know what love was. And um, she wasn't interested in that. So, my dad invested half of his GI Bill into getting my mom an education. You know, he had rescued her from the ghetto in Baltimore, Spalding Avenue. I don't know what it is about the people that come from Spalding Avenue in Baltimore City, love to fight, just love to fight. Anyway. Um, he had rescued her from that and got her educated to work on aircraft. She attended the Spartan School of Aeronautics in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I think, or I'm not sure. I'm not sure where, where she went to school, but I know it was Spartan School of Aeronautics. And, um, they both went together. And he didn't take his test to get his A&P. He thought IBM computers were the future. And he um, he followed that. But at that time, um, IBM kind of went under. They didn't do so well. And uh, it was a bad bet. But my mom finished. And then she got a job with Pratt Whitney. When she got her job, starting to make good money. Now, my dad's paying all the bills. He always had been paying all the bills. He still was paying all the bills. She started making that good money <laughs> and started uh, her own bank account and saving her money, keeping it to herself, unbeknownst to my father. One day, my dad's coming home from work and he sees her coming out of a bank that they don't bank at. And he pulls up on her and he's like, hey, what you doing here? And she was like, oh, oh, um, yeah, uh, I got an account here cause um, I'm trying to clean my credit. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm trying to clean my credit up. So I, I got an account here, uh-huh. So my father, now he sees something is up. So he just goes on, hoping that she's going to change. And she does not. So one day she tells my dad that she doesn't want to be a wife and she doesn't want to be a mother anymore. But before they break up, and before she sends him on his way, she wants to know. She always wanted a house built from the ground up. So would he help her get a house built from the ground up? So my dad used his damn um, 
Wil jij wel? Um, got her house built from the ground up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. I remember us visiting the house while it was being built. It took a long time because you know it's in Tornado Valley, so houses had to be built real sturdy. And so um, it's a beautiful little house. And um, we stayed in the house for a little while. My dad thought that if he did these things, if he did everything that she asked, that that would make her want to stay in the marriage and keep her in the marriage. But he didn't understand that she was just using him. She just saw him as a lame and somebody that she could get to do all these things and then throw him away when she got done. Now, I can't understand what my mother's logic was because my daddy is fine. You understand? My dad is a hunk, okay? After he came out the Marines, he worked for the fire department for 27 years, worked out all the time. He would do a thousand crunches, always had a six pack, always smelled good. My dad, he was always a hunk, you know? he. How, dad, how tall is my father? He's like, my father is like, I don't know, 6'2", six 6'3". Six we got tall men in our family. One of my uncles is like 6'5", and his son is like 6'8". You know, I, we got big, tall, skinny men in, in our family. But my dad was always built, you know, and um, just a happy-go-lucky kind of guy. And... Uh, he was just a good man. And my mom, she just shit it all over his heart and laughed. So my dad was thinking that if he did all these things that she would stay. So he gave it his all. He gave it his all. And then so. And um so we're in the house for a while and then I guess my mom revisits the conversation. Okay, so when you gonna leave, I'm ready for y'all to go type of attitude. So a week before, now this right here, this is karma. A week before we leave, before we schedule to leave, my mom got in trouble on her job. She lost a job. What happened, you ask? My mom had been sleeping with her supervisor on the job. And her supervisor was married. And unbeknownst to her, her supervisor was sleeping with another woman on the job. So my ghetto ass loved to fight Spalding Avenue mom fights <laughs> this chick on the job. Whooped her ass on the job and lost that good, good job and the right to work on aircraft ever again in life with a license you know she could probably get a job working on aircraft but not where you need your license so my dad wasted all this time on my mom wasted all his love wasted his gi bill money wasted his VA home loan money and he came back home to his family with us in tow and I'm quite sure because my, my family is not kind 
and not loving. I'm quite sure they just rubbed it all in, you know. These not our kids. We not watching them. They your problem. Da, 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 da. So here's my dad, humiliated, heartbroken. And he has us. And so he's just emotionally checked out. I definitely believe that my father looked at me and my little sister like we were his biggest mistakes in life because uh, we were you know just reminders of the bad decision that he made to be with my mom so mm, that equaled a rough start for me a lot of stuff happened to me and my sisters because my dad was so emotionally checked out and probably would have preferred not to have had us and definitely didn't want to deal with us. So wasn't any nurturing or any love or any hugs or any sympathy or any empathy or any kindness. We got treated like jail. We had food on the table, a roof over our head, and clothes on our back. That's That was my dad's uh, idea of parenting, you know. Uh, people in jail get that. But at least I thank God my dad was not a pedophile. Good Lord. Because if, 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 if that was in the equation i uh i don't i probably definitely would not have made it i don't think i could have survived just that kind of uh, mental trauma i mean i got molested but you know there's there's worse things that could have happened than what i went through um and i thank god i'm still here i thank god i'm still here and i thank god that all that stuff is gone. It's over. And that's not the rest of my life. You know, that's just something that I had to live through to, to get here. And it's, you know, all kinds of good days ahead. So don't feel sorry for me. Don't, don't, don't feel bad, you know, for what I went through. What I would like though, is if this story resonated with you, don't let this happen in your life, you know, Take your time and get to know who it is that you're partnering with. Do they genuinely love you for you? Or is this a come up for them? You know, can you be replaced by somebody else with money? Or, or, or you know, are they even capable of love? And if your heart has been broken and you have children and you're still hurting from that relationship. Get therapy. Do things to heal your heart so that you do not, your issues, you don't take them out on your children. They don't deserve that. They don't deserve that. Not at all. They did not ask to come here. They didn't ask to come here. And you giving them a shitty life is not doing them a favor. You don't have to have money to be kind, to be nurturing, to be loving, to have integrity, to give your all, you know, in raising your children. You don't have to have money for those things. There's plenty of people like the Wayans family. They grew up poor and they, how many of them is it? But they were happy and they support each other. So, you know, just bear those things in mind. All these stories that I'm telling, there's things that you can learn from them that so that you don't have to go through the you don't have to go through what I went through and you can identify some stuff now that you wasn't familiar with before. It wasn't even on your radar before. But now you know there's people out there like that, you know, that will do that. And so maybe you'll keep an eye out and you won't let these things that happen to me um, 
or my sisters won't happen to you or your children. You know, you know what I mean? So yeah, this, this these stories that I'm telling, they really happened and they really do happen. And a lot worse happens if you are not paying attention, you know? So yeah, <sighs> okay. Uh, if you're familiar with any of my videos, <laughs> then you know that God delivered me from homosexuality a long time ago. I was gay for a long time and God delivered me from it. And I wrote a book called Bedroom Secrets of an Ex-Lesbian with the objective of giving the ABCs and one, two, threes of how to easily give females orgasms because intimacy is a big part of relationships intimacy can be that glue when y'all are arguing and y'all not seeing eye to eye intimacy can you know it can it can smooth the path to compromise you know and make people come around y'all can make up and and not break up you have a financial strain. You got that good, good intimacy. Intimacy. That thing can make y'all stick it on through and not take it out on each other, and wind up ruining your relationship over a monetary problem that could be solved. You know, intimacy is not the most important thing in a relationship, but it is an important part. It is an important part, and a lot of women do without great intimacy been married for years and never had an orgasm. The husband always having them. They might have a trail of kids behind them. Wife ain't never had one. And she too, she's convinced that she can't. So she don't want to talk about it. She don't want to hear about it, you know, cause in her mind, her relationship, it is what it is. He just, you know, that's just what he's working with. And he, he can't get it done. And maybe she done convinced herself that something's wrong with her now. You know what I mean? So she don't think that it can happen. No, it can happen. You just don't know your own body. And he don't know it either. And so y'all just... <laughs> whatever. And it's not satisfying to her. And then she might not feel like she can say that to him. Scared that it's going to hurt his feelings. You know, it's a sensitive topic that a lot of people are uncomfortable discussing. And so a lot of needs continue to get unmet. So I wrote my book. There's nobody looking at you. Nobody knows what you're doing. Nobody knows if you click on that link in the description below and download my audio book. Nobody knows what you're listening to. But if you love your mate, why wouldn't you want to give them the best pleasure that they've ever had, you know? And every time they have one, they thinking about you. <laughs> and can't wait to have another one. I like it like that, you know? I can't. I like it when my lover just be like, come here, come here, come here. <laughs> Give me that leg. <laughs> I mean, you know, it can be real fun instead of making you nervous. You know, some people get nervous. They have, kind of feel like performance anxiety. Um, if you don't feel comfortable in the bedroom with a woman, get the book, get my audio book. Let me walk you through the parts of a woman's body and how to touch each part, how to grab hold of each part, how to finesse each part so that you blow in her mind, you know, and she's going to be begging for more. <laughs> and women... If you've been in a relationship or been in relationships for, you know, years and you've never had an orgasm, get the book, get the book and listen to my step-by-step -step instructions. 
okay? Because then you're going to know how to touch yourself. You're going to know how to manipulate those parts. You're going to know how to give yourself an orgasm. And then, you know, if your husband don't want to listen, if he don't want to listen to the book or whatever, just be like, okay, don't listen. But look, while you're doing that, I'm going to do this. <laughs> while he's doing his same old thing you know there's a couple of things you can do to get yourself there while he's doing his thing and you know both of y'all can meet in the middle yeah you don't ever have to settle for ungratifying intimacy anymore at all okay so check it out and i hope you enjoy it's a good listen you're gonna laugh a little bit you know you might get a little heated a little a little something hey I have friends that was married for 15 years and they was like, Brandy, you wrote that book. You gonna give me one of them copies, you know? And they, it was on an audio CD at the time and they would play it while they was in the bedroom, you know, and work it out together. And um, she told me, she was like, girl, they would be chasing after each other like teenagers again. I was like, now that's fire. After 15 years of marriage, you know, to get that spice back like that, that is what's up. That is what's up. So, yeah. Get the book and um, subscribe to the page if you like this content. Hope you do. And you have a wonderful day, okay? I hope I made you smile, even though this story was, oh, <laughs> some kind of way. I hope I made you laugh. Um and I, I just wish you well. I wish you all the best, okay? You have a beautiful, beautiful life.